everyone. We're going to get started. So if everybody could please take your seats. Great. So as you can see, we found a solution thanks to the lovely gentleman who lifted Reagan up, which by the way was Reagan's preference because she wanted to make sure that all of you could see us. Um, uh, so that's how we make stuff work. <laughs> uh, which we as actors, this wasn't how I intended to start this, uh, but I'll start it here since it's a good place to start it. Which we as disabled actors are, uh, it's a constant negotiation for us. Um, and you just saw that in action. So thanks Reagan. <laughs> So I'm just going to start by introducing myself and my esteemed colleagues and tell you a little bit about uh, Inclusion in the Arts, the organization that David and I uh, work for. David, who you just saw, his amazing performance. Um, so my name is Christine Bruno, and uh, like I just said, I'm an actor, and I'm also disability advocate for an organization called Inclusion in the Arts. We're uh, a nonprofit based in New York City. Basically, in a nutshell, uh, our reason for existence is to promote uh, the full inclusion of actors of color and actors with disabilities in film, theater, television, and related industries. So that's what we do. We've been around for 30 years. We originally were founded uh, in 1986 to address problems of racism and exclusion in the industry. And our current executive director, uh, Sharon Jensen, when she came on board in 1989, felt that it was really important to add disability to that diversity conversation. So basically, essentially, for the, the entire life of our organization, disability has played an integral role in any conversation that we have about diversity. Um, just quickly, a little bit about what David and I do. I started at the organization in 2005 uh, because Sharon felt, and rightly so, that, that disability was, while the conversation about race and ethnicity was um, moving forward by the time I started in, in 2001, um, sorry, 2005, the conversation about race and ethnicity had moved significantly forward, although, as we know, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, the conversation about disability had not moved forward, and she felt like there re really needed to be a specific uh, person in place to sort of help usher decision makers into working with artists with disabilities and whatever that entails from casting referrals to uh, consulting about scripts, consulting about accessibility issues, uh, accessible audition spaces, hiring interpreters, and just about dispelling the myths and assumptions of what artists with disabilities are capable of in general. So that sort of is the, the, my function. Um, and David came on in 2009, and David is the disability and programming associate. So um, our job together basically is to increase uh, the opportunities for artists with disabilities on our stages, on our screens. I'd say about 60% of our job is casting referrals, meaning we get uh, refer we get calls from casting directors, from decision makers looking for talent with disabilities for specific jobs. The other 40% is things like this, our, our advocacy, going out into communities, speaking at, um, you know, great conferences like LEAD and other TCG and those sort of things, just making people more aware. And I think, you know, strides have been made as we see, as, as we can see from the increase in the participation at, at LEAD, um, which I think Betty now is at what, did, did we say up to 450? 470. 470, so that's, that's amazing. So, and so our conversation here today, like Tiffany said, is to, to speak uh, not necessarily to, to audience, 
participation, but to the, the artists with disabilities component is getting artists on, sta on our stages specifically. And we're so lucky today to have Reagan Linton, I don't know who those of you were here for Thursday night, saw Reagan's amazing performance. Um, and so Reagan is here to speak about her work as an actor and specifically around her work as an actor with Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And this is Julie Simon from Oregon Shakespeare Festival. She, uh, you're the access coordinator, is that your correct title? So we're just gonna have an informal conversation with Julie and Reagan, and then I'm gonna open it up to questions. So in doing, I had a great conversation with Julie and Reagan about a week and a half ago, just about their experience, their specific experiences of working with OSF and, and how to sort of navigate that, that landscape of being an artist with a disability in a, in a major uh, theatrical institution that, that has a, a long and you know distinguished history uh, of working you know with artists and and um, and 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 bringing disabled artists into the fold so we're gonna talk a little bit about that I'd like to start by <clears throat> excuse me in my research I found that OSF has uh, on their website what they call a value statement and they have one, two, three, four, five, seven core principles. And I'm just gonna review the, the core principles are um, excellence, inclusion, learning, financial health, heritage, environmental responsibility, and company. And they say, uh, these are the values we hold at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. They are the center of everything we do how we, and describe how we work together. While we recognize the need for balance among them, these values guide us in all of our decisions. So I'm just gonna read you their, um, their value statement on inclusion so we can uh, frame this conversation with Reagan and Julie today. So as inclusion, they say, we believe the inclusion of a diversity of people, ideas and cultures enriches both our insights into the work we present on stage and our relationships with each other. So if, if, you, if, you, if anyone's ever been to OSF or know, and I'm sure you all know about OSF, um, in doing my research, I found that they, they've actually done a significant amount of work around issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in recent years. And these are just some of the things that, that they've done. Um, like I just read the value statement, they have an audience development manifesto which they developed in 2010. And is, am I right about that, 2010? Yeah. Um, they have a disability inclusion planning council. Uh, they hired a diversity consultant. They uh, created an access coordinator position which Julie holds. They don't have that yet. But for a few, how long have they had that? Um, I think they've had an access coordinator position for quite a while, but it was part-time for a while and, mm. and it has grown. Um, they've established action committees. They've established access committees for audiences. They have affinity groups. Um, they have the development of the open dialogue series. Um, and what we're gonna talk about today is the hiring of deaf and disabled artists on stage and behind the stage um, in artistic positions. So that's, so if you just look at that, if you just go down that list, that, that's a pretty impressive commitment to issues of diversity and inclusion. Um, and I would like Julie and, and Reagan to, to talk a little bit about their experiences working at OSF. And I, I think the first thing I'd like to know is how did both of you come to work at OSF? I'll start with you, Julie, since you're... Good morning, everybody. I became the Access Services Coordinator in March, though this is my seventh season with OSF. And my first five seasons, I was the lead interpreter for the deaf actor in the company during his rehearsals. But I've also been a patron of OSF for over 30 years. And uh, so that's how I came to know about OSF. As Access Services Coordinator, 
most of my job is outward facing. I work with patrons. Uh, we provide audio description, open caption, interpreted performances. I also work with patrons who have mobility issues. I work closely with the box office to make sure that patrons are seated uh, where they can enjoy the performances. At OSF, uh, as Christine just mentioned, we have, we have the Audience Development Manifesto. We have open dialogue forums, which occur every two weeks on various topics around access, disability, uh, diversity, inclusion for all aspects of the company. Um, we, we don't necessarily have one person in the company who deals with accessibility for company members. Um, but there are a number of us in the company who do work on that as part of our, our jobs. Um, what, I'm, I'm interested in what's the other, you have another component to your job which actually isn't your job as access coordinator. Could you, could you talk a little bit about working, your, working with Howie? Certainly. As I uh, mentioned, the first five seasons I was at OSF, I was the lead interpreter, and so I do have um, a perspective from the company side. Uh, when Howie was offered a contract, the artistic team realized that they needed to hire interpreters. Howie uh, started in 2009, and my first season was 2010, but we worked closely with um, company members, stage management, with the acting company, with the costume department to make sure that uh, his needs were met uh, in terms of communication. And part of the commitment to diversity around hiring deaf artists is providing appropriate services, and that means hiring interpreters. Um, we, for the first couple seasons, um, OSF relied on local interpreters. If any of you have been to Ashland, Oregon, we're in the southern part of the state. It's very rural. We have a very small local deaf community and a very small interpreting community. And uh, Howie's first season, they relied on local interpreters who had other jobs. And they, I don't know that he actually had full coverage for all of his rehearsals. I was brought down during his second season for a three-month period to cover his rehearsal period as the, um, the full-time interpreter, and then my team members were uh, a local interpreters. And then I moved to Ashland. And, uh, and so I was one of the local interpreters, and we also, we did need to bring interpreters in um, from out of the area because those of us who were local had other jobs and we weren't available as much as needed. OSF also used a sign coach, brought in a sign coach the last couple of seasons to work with the other actors in the company on translating their lines and teaching them their lines in sign language. So we needed to provide interpreting services for the sign coach, often at the same time that Howie was in rehearsal, but they were in different rooms. So we worked really hard to develop a team of interpreters to make sure that the communication needs of everyone were being met. Um, so it's, it's a process, it takes commitment, not just philosophically, but also financially. And uh, I think that's, uh, it, we've been very fortunate at OSF that we've been able to cover the communication needs that we needed to cover, and OSF has provided that financial support. So, um, what, what, because you've been, because you've been working with Howie now for a number of years, Howie, and we're, to, I realize I didn't say his last name, we're talking about, act, his name is Howie Sego. Um, and this, he's going into his seventh season, is that correct? Working uh, with OSF? Howie is not currently in the company, but he will be back next season. And so I think it will be his seventh season That's next what, year. Yeah, yeah, I think seven, which is amazing. Um, so what are the what are some of the the um, quickly? I don't want to get to Reagan, but what are a, a couple of the interpreter-based lessons that you learned through that process of um, figuring out w what the best situation would be for Howie to meet to meet his artistic needs? Well. One of the things is talking to Howie, uh, talking to his, to his, to him directly to find out what his needs are. 
One thing that I think it's important to realize is that it's not the deaf actor or the deaf sign coach's job to find the service providers, but I think it's important that they be involved in the process. And so, um, and, and so Howie was very clear about what he wanted. When we were looking for interpreters to bring in from out of the area for a three-month period, um, we, we sent out a, we worked with HR, we sent out a job announcement, um, and I worked with the producer for the company to screen the applications and the applicants, and then we forwarded the three finalists to Howie, and he had a Skype call with them, so he could talk to them directly in sign language um, and make sure that the skills that they had were going to meet his needs, uh, and then he told us who he recommended, and, and so we did it that way. So it's very important to make sure that the deaf artist is involved in the process, but, not, but is not the one who has to go out and find the service providers. So that was something. And over the course of the, the time that Howie was in the company for six seasons, um, his needs changed depending on the kind of roles he had, the size of the roles, um, what the needs of the production were. And so it was important to make sure that the interpreters knew what those changes were and, uh, and we, had, uh, we would have a staff meeting. As the lead interpreter, it meant I was also doing the scheduling. So I would meet with the interpreters at the top of the rehearsal period and we would have the stage manager from Howie's show come in and talk to us and we would make sure that we were all on the same page in terms of communication access. Uh, Howie was responsible for his own actor needs uh, just like the other actors were, but we wanted to make sure that communication was clear. Uh, Howie was the one who explained to the rest of the company and to his cast members what his communication needs were. We just provided the interpretation. And, um, and I think one of the really nice benefits is that everyone got used to having interpreters in the room so that when we had interpreted performances, the actors in the company and the stage managers were used to having signers there, which was a really nice benefit. And so it wasn't just the benefit of the cast members or the general acting company, because at OSF we have usually between 90 and 100 actors in rotating repertory theater every season. Um, so it was the whole company, but it also was a benefit to our patrons when they came to see interpreted performances. Great. Thank you. Um, Bregan. How did you come to OSF? How did I come to OSF? Yeah. <laughs> In a wheelchair. A no. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I I think it, it happened. So I started out in Denver, Colorado. I was working with a group called Family, which hopefully some of you are um, familiar with. It's a company that works exclusively with actors with all different types of disabilities. Um, and so I was performing with them, decided to go to graduate school. I went to UC San Diego. And there was a bit of a relationship between some of the professors at UC San Diego and OSF. So Scott Kaiser, the development of um, the company, the develop, I don't know what his official title is, but he's, he's essentially responsible for going out and scouting talent and developing the company. Um, and he came down to San Diego and ironically, for those of you who saw me the other night, saw me in a production of Glass Menagerie <laughs> um, and became interested in me. And so it just kind of happened that I became aware of OSF, they became aware of me. Um, I was not cast immediately right out of uh, graduate school in 2013, but um, a year later I auditioned for Joy Dixon, the casting director in Los Angeles, and was cast. Um, and I'll just mention, I, I was not the first wheelchair user ever to be cast at OSF. There was another actor in the 90s who was cast, and I'm from, a, for, you said you remembered. I did, him. I said his name the other day I'm when I totally talked to you. Totally forgetting, uh, Kenneth, Crow, Kenneth, Kenneth Crow. Crow. Kenneth Crow. Kenneth yes. Crow. Um, he, was an, he had been in a production of Midsummer Night's Dream in the 90s. Uh, however, I was the first repertory company actor hired. And the important distinction of that is that I think 
sometimes for artists with disabilities, it can feel like we're, we're brought in when it fits, you know, for a one production here, one production there, as opposed to saying, hey, you're a well-rounded artist, you have the ability to, um, you know, transform and be in different productions. So I was cast in two different productions uh, at OSF last year. One was Much Ado About Nothing and one was a, a Taiwanese play. Both, uh, both roles had not been written for a disability. Um, and I'll, I will also note that one of the first unique experiences of OSF was that I had been cast as an understudy because most of the repertory actors are cast as understudies um, for one or two roles. So I was cast to have an understudy in Antony and Cleopatra, was, which was out on the outdoor Elizabethan stage. They realized after they got there that uh, the role that I was supposed to understudy was supposed to be on both levels of the Elizabethan stage and the second level was not accessible. So my understudy was canceled, um, my understudy position. Um, so that was one of the first experiences that OSF had of, oh, casting somebody with a disability takes a little bit of additional thought in terms of um, you know, what other functions that actor is gonna have. I will mention they also had another experience the previous year involving race and understudy and somebody that had been cast and then all of a sudden they realized, oh, this was potentially not racially appropriate casting for the understudy. So it's not just disability that they've been having that experience with. Um, uh, so yeah, but that's, that's a little bit about how I came to OSF. Um, I'll also mention that when I came to OSF, generally the the environment, aside from the Elizabethan, was fairly accessible. They did end up renovating an apartment um, because at OSF, actors are housed by the company um, and they did not have any accessible, wheelchair accessible housing. So they renovated an apartment, um, which they also felt was a long time coming in general <laughs> um, and gave them the opportunity to do that. I gave them the opportunity to do that. Um, and there were other various things that they, um, I guess, renovated or, or updated. But I think one of the important things also to emphasize is that it did not take an, a, a huge additional financial commitment um, of any kind. The, the accommodations that it took to bring me into the company were very small and um, so I just want to emphasize that because I think that's often a misconception that it's going to take a huge financial commitment to bring in artists with disabilities and that's not always the case. So what was, um, I just want to also mention in your bio I read that you were, the, which I knew anyway, you were the first uh, wheelchair user to graduate from UCSD, is that correct? Yes, I, uh, I was the first wheelchair the user to, acting program. Yeah, to be yeah. brought into that MFA program at UC San Diego. When I was researching, um, I, I found approximately five people that had gone through some of the top graduate MFA acting programs across the country that had uh, disabilities and um, so it, it felt like a pretty pretty big deal, you know, to to have a wheelchair uh, represented in one of those one of those companies. And I'll just mention that since I've been there, um, a couple of years after I graduated, they they uh, took another actor who has mm -hmm. cerebral palsy. Um, they also one of my friends, Jason Dorward, is a quadriplegic, and he's in the um, graduate the PhD theater program there. So I feel like if there's one school, I'll just give a shout out that UCSD is starting to create a tradition of bringing actors with disabilities into the program, which I'm really proud of. That's great. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what the actual experience was like on a sort of on a day-to-day -day basis, sort of navigating the campus, sort of the rehearsal um, process, um, if there were any issues in terms of, did you have a, uh, someone to go to, to like, for instance, Howie had Julie as his sort of point person because there was, uh, there, there was already groundwork laid because they had worked with Howie before, so by the time you get to the fifth or sixth season, there's kind of a protocol in place. What was it like for you? Since I think, I don't know for sure because I wasn't able to 
uh, find this out in my research, whether they actually have hired anybody with a mobility disability since I saw Ken Crow 20 years ago at LSF. Yeah, I, I'm not, I don't, I, I did a lot of asking around when I got there to try to figure out answers to those questions. Um, as far as I understood, I don't believe there was somebody, I think they did a production of um, uh, Welcome Home Jenny Sutter a few years ago. Do you know whether that actor had a disability? There, so there, there was a, a play about a returning veteran, I believe, um, who had a disability, and I'm not sure whether the actor that was cast actually had a disability. I think she did, but it wasn't a wheelchair-based one. Anyway, um, I think in general, one thing to be aware of is that OSF is on the cutting edge of a lot of inclusive diversity work. However, I think they would be the first to admit also that in the pantheon of diversity and inclusion, disability has, has been kind of the last, the last one to make it into the mix. And they're working on um, changing that. Uh, and particularly when it comes to the acting company, there, there is representation of actors that have disabilities, non-visible disabilities, but I think Howie has been one of the main um, individuals who's, who started to change the tradition of, hey, Disability is also about, you know, particularly when you're working in a visual um, medium uh, or something that is representational in terms of what we what we take in uh, in front of us, that visible representation is really important. The the visible representation of difference, whether that comes through communication, whether it comes through new mobility. Um, so that was something that was, and I'll also just throw in. I think it's also something that. <laughs> I've experienced a lot as an actor with a wheelchair. One of my friends who formed Family, she was one of the founders of Family, used to say, you know, it's so funny that like Broadway can get these gigantic multi-million dollar fake elephants on stage and, you know, but they can't get a wheelchair on stage, you know? And that's why, as you'll see this morning, I know there, there are different philosophies about like when technology breaks down, how do we accommodate? But one of my big passions is to emphasize that there's always a way. As, as long as there are other human beings who are creative and we can work as a community, there is always a way to get a performer with a disability on a stage. Um, and, and so I think it just takes some ingenuity and sometimes some manpower or woman power. Um, but that's why I chose to accommodate this morning the way I did of saying, hey, just pick me up and put me on the stage. Um, because I think that's often, at least for my experience being in a wheelchair, that's how we do it. And I will just mention at OSF, one of the, one of the environmental challenges is that the dressing rooms in the Bomer Theater where I was doing both of my shows last year are downstairs and the stage is up one level. So every time I went to the stage, um, I had to take an elevator that is also being shared by the costume crew that is taking costumes up and down. Um, and Bill Rausch, you know, bless his heart, I gave him a wheelchair tour at the end of my, of my time there because I thought, you know, it's important that you kind of understand the you know, the route that we take as wheelchair users. And he was, he was very surprised by a lot of it. Um, he visited a couple places on the campus he had never been to because he just didn't have to take that particular wheeling route. Um, he also didn't realize that I had to take an elevator every time I wanted to get on stage. Uh, luckily, there was only one show during the season um, that, uh, for which the elevator did not function. And at that moment, it was, it was about two-thirds of the way through the show, and I had to get on the stage, and so the stage hands picked me up and carried me up the stairs. Um, so anyway, I think in general, the environment was, is not entirely accessible. I think the attitude of OSF was very proactive in terms of um, coming to me. And as we mentioned before, there's not a point person for an acting company member or a, uh, um, or a company member, you know, for instance, uh, Michael Mag is the head lighting designer at OSF. He uses a wheelchair. Um, but there's not a person that is designated specifically to, to be that point person for acting company members and deal with their access issues. So it was a lot of kind of, 
cobbling together, we're like, well, do you go to the um, stage manager for this? Do you go to the box office for this? Do you go to the safety manager? And that sometimes was challenging, of feeling like, hey, there's an issue, I don't know where to address it. Um, and one other thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll pass along, I'm sorry, I'm monopolizing, but um, there wasn't, there, there is, was an access committee when I arrived at OSF, that's actually how I met Julie, I think the first time, which was intended to address issues of, um, of access at OSF, um, but I think, I, I found that sometimes they were addressing issues more dealing with the patronage as opposed to the artist concerns. And I think that's something that also OSF has realized. Um, so that's what I'll say. Julie, I have a quick question for you, sort of bouncing off what Reagan just said. So, so the fact that there is no real point person for members of the acting company with disabilities did, did any of that sort of inadvertently fall on you as access coordinator for patrons? And, and how do you navigate that and what suggestions would you have for, for rectifying that? Well, I've only been the access services coordinator since March, so uh, my tenure has been pretty short. I think, um, I, I think what has happened in the past is that company members would go through their own department. So if it was a company member in the costume shop or the production building or the box office, they would go through their own supervisor and some, it might end up at HR or somewhere else. Uh, I'm happy to serve as a resource to, to company members. My job is outward facing and I do focus on patrons, but, I'm, but I do work with other departments. In terms of the open dialogue forum that we were talking about earlier, I hosted the open dialogue forum two weeks ago, uh, two, two and a half weeks ago, it was in conjunction, we had uh, four interpreted performances over the weekend and so I asked if I could host the open dialogue series during that week because we had all of our performance interpreters in town. So the performance interpreters were there, our open caption operators, our audio describers, and company members from all departments. And we were talking about general access issues. It wasn't just about patrons, it wasn't just about <clears throat> the deaf community or, or deaf company members. And it was, it was really good and several people brought up the issue of who, do, who who do we go to if we are a company member and we have these issues? And so that topic of conversation is now on the forefront and That's we're gonna great. keep that going. Um, one of the things that was mentioned earlier is that OSF has had a diversity consultant for several years, a woman named Carmen Morgan. And there is a diversity and inclusion planning council of which I am a member. I have been on the committee for about three seasons. And, and most of the talk is not around accessibility issues. Right. And there are a couple of us who are, uh, who are trying to change that. And that was part of the reason I wanted to host the open dialogue series so that we could talk about access issues and what that means for company members, what that means for patrons, what does that look like uh, not everybody has a visible disability. One of, the, one of the other really nice things that we have at OSF are affinity groups. We have four public affinity groups, we have several that are private affinity groups, and we have a new affinity group this season, it's called the Neurodiversity Affinity Group, so that people who process information differently, company members, it's not for patrons, it's for company members, um, who may have traumatic brain injury or may have post traumatic stress disorder or might have autism or, or Asperger's or uh, dyslexia or something can get together and talk about what they need as company members, talk about it in a safe space. One of the, uh, the head of our voice and text department, Allison Carey, uh, I'm sorry, Rebecca Clark Carey, uh, has been working with actors who have dyslexia or who have other um, issues when it comes to reading scripts. And she's been working with them for a couple of years on what font size works, what, what font so style works, what maybe you need a, a script on a paper color other than white. And so we, we're working, she's working with actors in that realm. Uh, so there are people within the festival who are working 
within different departments and for different employee constituents, uh, page, uh, company members, um, on these issues. And, and the open dialogue that we had a couple weeks ago brought a lot of people together to talk about this. And there were a lot of people there who had never thought about these issues who work in different departments, so now they're thinking about it. And that's part of what the Open Dialogue series does. And just is, the, I would imagine for, for someone uh, like Reagan with a mobility disability, there would be discussions with uh, the designers um, around set, any potential set issues. Um, is there any sort of um, negotiation in terms of uh, uh, aesthetic versus practicality? Um, yeah, so I'll mention a couple, a couple different um, examples. Uh, first of all, uh, for, for myself uh, as a wheeling performer, sometimes costumes are a consideration. Um, and the costume department was very, uh, very accommodating in talking to me about what I needed and being open to, okay, here's the design, but how do we, how do we adapt this? So for instance, I was wearing a shawl in one of my, in one of my performances and a shawl, for those of you who have ever wheeled with a shawl or use your arms, like it could easily fall off. <laughs> um, and so they would put like little snaps up at, at the top. Similarly, I was wearing some, uh, some gloves that were like velour and I was thinking, well, pushing, that's gonna be really difficult because it just slips. And so they put some like grip on my gloves. Um, in terms of staging, there were a couple of interesting experiences I had. One was that for Much Ado About Nothing, they were, kind of putting it in this uh, outdoor villa and they wanted to use turf on the stage. So they actually came to me a few months before I got to OSF and said, hey, you know, we're thinking about putting turf on the stage. When you get to OSF, can we give you a couple different samples and have you roll on them and tell us what, what works for you? So when I got to OSF, I rolled on the two different samples and I said, oh, well, you know, really this, this one that's a shorter cut works a little better for me. So come to, you know, first rehearsal on the stage, they had chosen the other one, <laughs> the longer cut. <laughs> but I appreciate that at least they consulted me about it. But I think that was a really, a really great example of like, you know, they took it into consideration. They still decided for design purposes to go with the other one, um, which made it, you know, so I had to accommodate slightly um, and I got my workout pushing across the, the turf every, every show. Um, so it was just, you know, an example of like thinking about it is one step and then putting it into action is the next step. Um, I'll also say when I was working on my other play, the Taiwanese play, uh, we realized that <laughs> going off the stage, on one side there was access to get to the backstage. If we went off the other side, because of some of the set pieces, I was not able to get around to go down to the dressing room. And the, um, the director had directed me to come off of the right side of the stage, and then it was gonna hit intermission. And so I was like, well, I'm gonna be sitting on the right side of the stage like for uh, the entirety of an intermission, you know, essentially like 30 minutes. Um, so he ended up uh, crafting this moment during intermission where I would cross the stage theatrically, which was really just to get to the other side of the stage so that I could go downstairs and drink some water. Um, so, you know, again, ideas of how sometimes it can feel like design and accessibility are in conflict and it's that's really not true it's just a matter of finding where is that middle ground and finding a compromise and a creative way of solving these problems or not problems but solving these conundrums um tiffany i just want to do a tiffany and she's talking tiffany tiffany could we do just do it i just want to do a quick time check so we don't because I want to give time for the audience to ask Reagan and Julie questions. We are right now at 11.15 almost, so if we want to go a little over because we didn't start right away, okay. I think that's fine. Do you so want to say we have 10 minutes? 10 minutes? 10 minutes uh, for this section or 10 minutes, 10 minutes total? Probably 10 minutes total, okay. unless there are key points. We want you guys to say no. what you need to say. Okay, <laughs> all right. So. 
Yes, of course you can. I, I want to add something about um, what the, the aesthetics of the show. With a deaf actor on stage, there's going to be sign language on stage. And if you've got a right-handed signer, and the, the signer is signing so their right hand is facing upstage, what they sign or what they fingerspell may not be clear to whoever they're talking to. Um, and it, part of the discussions around in rehearsal uh, were around who's the communication for, it, it, mostly for the production, so what other actor, what other character needs to see the sign language, who's signing to each other, are they looking at each other? Are they, if, in our Elizabethan stage, we do have several levels. If you've got two people who are communicating on different levels, they have to, the person on the upper level has to be close enough to the edge to see the sign language that's being done on the lower level. So there were some staging and blocking considerations um, around having a visual language as part of the production. And that's where the director and the uh, actors, all of them, not just the deaf actor, but the hearing actors, work together and collaboratively to make sure that this was going to work out. They also worked together to figure out cues if there was a pause before Howie had a line, um, because a lot of actors go off auditory cues, and if you've got a deaf actor who can't do that, you need some kind of visual cue. So they would build in movements. The other actors would build in movements uh, that would provide visual cues so that Howie could then say his line at the right timing. And it could have, it, sometimes it was just a matter of one actor putting his hand on another actor's shoulder and that movement was enough of a visual cue for Howie. And it did, nobody else, nobody in the audience knew that that's what was going on. So there are ways where um, within the rehearsal period, everyone involved in the production can work together to make sure that there is inclusion on stage uh, to meet everybody's communication needs. So I, I just want to, um, because we haven't talked about sort of what the impact is about what we're talking about, having disabled actors on stage. What is the impact on the audiences? What's, what's been your experience been, uh, Reagan, specifically, let's just use OSF as the example. What, what kind of feedback did you get from the audience? Yeah, um, I'd say the feedback was overwhelmingly positive and overwhelmingly encouraging. Um, you know, a lot of the time when I would roll off stage, uh, OSF, outside you have this area called the bricks where people kind of gather and people would often encounter me. Some of them wouldn't realize that I actually used a wheelchair in real life. They thought it was just a character choice. Um, but that was like a little shift that I realized is really important to acknowledge that because there's not that tradition of people with disabilities, actors with disabilities playing roles, people make that assumption that it's a character choice, which I think is something good for us to realize, oh, there's still, there's still a lot of, um, you know, ground to be covered there in terms of changing that tradition. So that people at least think, oh, that actor might actually have a disability. Um, Overall, everybody that I encountered said, hey, this is something we've been waiting for. We want it. We're so glad to see that OSF is doing it. Um, and so I think if there's, if there's a takeaway, one takeaway that I'd like to offer from today, it's that <laughs> it's important to think about changing the tradition uh, of inclusive uh, uh, you know, casting. And that doesn't happen just with one show. That happens with bringing a Howie back for seven seasons. That also happens with not just bringing Bring Howie, Howie back. back. <laughs> you know, that happens with bringing in a Reagan. It happens with making 5%, 10% of the, the company um, inclusive of people with disabilities. You know, particularly for OSF when you're dealing with a company of 100 actors. And granted, OSF is doing a lot around different types of inclusion. And um, so sometimes there are just, you know, unique requirements in terms of the material that they're doing. Um, but that's another piece, is choosing the material and what are the stories you're putting up there. And I think particularly, um, you know, when you're just thinking of what inclusion means, it is always important, and I know most of us in this room probably know this, that 
you know, disability is something that can affect anyone and probably will affect anyone. And it is hugely represented in our human population. So um, I think it's something like 15% in the United States almost or 20, 20 19, almost 20% 20 of 19. people in the United States identify as somebody with a disability. So if you are putting work on stage that is meant to reflect the actual human population, there is no way that you can leave out disability. Um, and shoot, there was one other thing I was going to say, but it slipped from my mind, so I'll pass the mic. And I want, do you have, do you have any closing thoughts, Julie, before we open it up? We probably have time for like two questions. So if you have a burning desire to say something, please do. No, it also slipped from my mind. Okay. <laughs> so do we have any, any questions? Yes. I think a mic is coming your way. Hi, I'm Kristen from City Theater right here in Pittsburgh, and um, I have a question, and it might not be the best question given the amount of time we have because it could take a long discussion, but I feel like I want to at least put it out there now, and maybe it's something that continues throughout the day, uh, and it uh, revolves around language, and um, this has been something, uh, as I've sat through some uh, lead sessions um, earlier uh, this week, uh, that has been coming up, and it really excites me to sort of have this conversation. Christine, when you were talking about the Alliance, you referred to um, the artists that you work with as disabled artists. And, um, you know, for the last however many handful of years, we've been really big on people first language uh, and using that as sort of our, our basis for how we talk about, you know, our patrons, our artists. Um, but I've been encountering more and more artists who have disabilities who are, are flipping that back um, mm -hmm. the opposite direction mm -hmm. uh, and talking about that, you know, as, as sort of, you know, so uh, important in their art and just in their identity. Uh, and I'm not sure that there is a, a right answer, but I'm just curious to hear, um, since we have all you wonderful ladies up there, uh, sort of your perspective on that a little right. bit. Right. I'll just g give you my perspective personally. Uh, I, pref I prefer disabled artists because it's it's a it's a term of empowerment for me, right? But in our organization, we use them interchangeably because we understand that the industry the industry has barely caught up to people first language, so that's why we haven't sort of fully adopted the um, using uh, disabled as an adjective first. Um, the empowerment, sort of social justice component, but we use them interchangeably. I don't know, how do uh, you feel, Reagan? You know, I don't have one perspective. I think, if anything, yes, I see myself as just somebody who, as all of us are, we're all unique in our abilities, and um, so I've, I've kind of, historically not gone for disabled because I just think I, I operate, I move through the world in, a, in my own unique way. However, I think the biggest thing to, that I like to emphasize in this way is don't let the terminology get in the way of having the discussion. That right. we are all going to, is, I don't know if it's okay to cuss on HowlRound, but we're all gonna fuck up, you know? Like, um, and that's okay. The, the important thing is that we continue to have the conversation and that we, you know, if you're having a conversation with somebody, then ask them what terminology they use and then get on with it, you know? Don't let that be the thing that holds us up from, you know, having the more difficult parts of that discussion about uh, how, we, how we just get actors on, on stage. And I think that's a, a the, if we have one huge takeaway, from today, if we had to pick one, I would say talk to the artist. Consult the artist, because they're gonna know what's best for them and what they prefer, instead of making assumptions about what you think they'll prefer, what you think they'll be prefer to be called. So I, I would, you know, if we had to choose one, which of course we don't, that, that would be my one. <laughs> Julie? One of the benefits we've seen from the open dialogue series that happen every two weeks is that we're learning how to talk about these issues because even though we have great support from our leadership team, from the artistic director and the executive director, uh, we have it in our mission statement, not everyone in our organization is in the same place on this journey of learning how to talk about diversity and inclusion and accessibility. And by having these regular discussions on different topics, we're all learning together 
how to talk about it and how to be comfortable with the words coming out of our mouth or off of our hands. And so that's one of the benefits of having the open dialogue series. We come up with a lot of ideas. We don't come up with a whole lot of answers, but we're asking a lot of questions. I've got a, a question for you. Um, because as, as you were talking, I was thinking about my own scenario, uh, teaching at Duke and the head of the arts program there is, has got hearing impairment, although he's come to that recently and he's a musician. And, and thinking, okay, we gotta get him to think of being a part of the disabled community so that we can get him to loosen up some purse strings. Um, <laughs> I mean, just practical thinking there, strategic maybe. And I was wondering what it was at OSF that provided the impetus for them to really jump on board and, and get so engaged in this. You know, and maybe there's some lesson there of how to get other places um, to jump on board. I mean, was it a person? Uh, was it going to lead somewhere along the line? No. Um, I mean, I think it always probably originates with people because <laughs> we're also dealing with a, a, an art form that deals with people. Um, I don't know who, but I, I think it's probably a combination of patrons that wanted it. I think it's Bill Rausch realizing, hey, we want to reflect the world, and the world includes people with disabilities, um, and company members, and you know, bringing in people that do have disabilities, and then all of a sudden becoming aware of where you're, where you're missing the boat. Um, so I don't think it's, I don't know if it was one particular person, but it all comes from people. And that's where um, another takeaway I would say is, um, you know, for any of us who are patronizing the arts, who are involved in the arts, um, it's, a, it's a group effort. And therefore, it can't just be the actors with disabilities that are advocating for the accessibility to continue beyond the audience. Um, it has to be the people who are going to the shows saying, hey, we really enjoyed seeing Howie. We really enjoyed seeing Spring Awakening. We enjoyed these things. We want to see more of it. And as my cultural, you know, my community institution, you need to be doing this um, and continue to, you know, give that feedback to, to the cultural leaders. Um, and I think, you know, I think in Ashland that has been happening, but that doesn't mean that it still can't happen more. But I think, you know, the arts are based on demand a lot of the time. It's based on artistic vision, but it's also based on who's coming to see it, what are they coming to see, what do they want. So the more we give that feedback to our theaters and our cultural institutions of this is something we want to see more of and we demand to see more of, the more you're gonna see of it. And I also think as organizations, we have to remember that if it doesn't, it does, if it starts with one person, it shouldn't end when that person's tenure is over, which is often what happens if somebody has a, if a, if a particular artistic director has a commitment to an issue, often it just dies after that person leaves um, that position. And we have to remember that what we're trying to do is change the culture of the institution so that diversity and inclusion is is part of everything from the top down, from the boardroom, you know, to the actors on stage and everything in between. I, our mission statement includes ex inclusion. And one of the ways that we are showing that to the community is in all of our job postings. It's got the job description and at the bottom there's a statement about diversity and inclusion at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So if you are, if you don't, are, are not interested in that, don't apply. Because for all of our outward facing positions at all levels, part of the interview process is an interview with members of the Diversity and Inclusion Planning Council. And I've right. been on plenty of those interviews. Um, there are usually three or four or five of us from, uh, we call it DIPSI, D-I-P-C. Um, and it's really obvious which candidates have either never thought about diversity and inclusion, even though it's written into the job announcement, um, or, or, and are not interested in it, or are interested but just don't know how to talk about it. And so that's been very clear as well. And that's just something that we do on all of our job descriptions from, um, from leadership positions down to house staff and, uh, and other positions. 
So that's something small that your organization can do as well to, to make people aware of what you're doing. And there was one other thing I was going to comment on. Oh, our board of directors has several subcommittees, the finance committee and this committee. They now have a diversity and inclusion subcommittee on our board. And there are people who are, um, who are thinking about these issues, how to make our board more diverse, uh, and how, how that impacts in the rest of the organization. So, so it, it's not just one person. We're very lucky that we have Bill Rausch as our artistic director and Cynthia Ryder as our executive director and the leadership team, but our board, is, our board of directors is, uh, is on board with this, no pun intended, and um, so it helps that we have organizational-wide support that doesn't mean that everybody in the organization, we're a large organization, is in the same place as I mentioned before, but it's, it really helps to have that commitment from the, the leadership. I, are we good, Tiffany? Is I think we're gonna have? take a break. Um, we'll try to keep it to 10 minutes and start back again at 11.40. Um, I wanna give a huge round of applause to this thank amazing you. group. Reagan and Julie, thank you so much. And please, and I would encourage everyone, um, because we had to cut the Q&A session a little short, if you have additional questions, please write them down on your, on your post-its, because we'll have time at the end of the day to, to address any uh, additional burning questions you might have. Thanks so much. Great. See you in 10.